Oh, camera, sorry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest guest talks webinar. Firstly, I'd like to wish a Ramadan Mubarak to anyone in here observing the holy month of Ramadan. Today's discussion will center around coding and its related disciplines, skills, and instructional approaches. And we'll discover together how mastering coding skills can empower our students to navigate the digital, the digital landscape effectively, unlocking endless opportunities for innovation and growth in today's ever-changing world. I won't give too much away as we'll hear from our fantastic panelists shortly. But first, for all attendees, you can find the control panel on the side. There's a Q&A tab. Please feel free to use it to ask us questions as the panelists would love to hear your thoughts and we'll try to get to them at the end of the webinar. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our chair and moderator, Philippa Raithmel, author and founder of Adruption Education Consultancy to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you and over to you, Philippa. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here um, and Ramadan Kareem to everybody. Welcome to this um, session on webinar, which is going to be all about digital literacy and unlocking the potential in our students and all learners, actually. I'd like to introduce you to our guest speakers here. So if we go with Marcus, would you like to give an introduction to yourself, please? Sure. My name is uh, Marcus miller Habig. Uh, I am currently the acting CEO for 4012 which is a uh, government-funded disruptive higher education coding institution. Uh, we only do software development as an education, uh, and it is uh, very different from uh, from other educational centers. And we will explain a little bit more as, uh, as this webinar goes on. Amazing. Thank you so much, Zainab. Hi everyone, I'm Zainab Betty. I'm the assistant head teacher at Gems Wellington International School and I'm also the director of innovation and digital technology across the Gems Wellington and Jamira schools. Brilliant, thank you so much. And Hanan. Thanks Philippa. Hi, my name is Hanan and I am the co-founder of iCode Junior. We're a online first coding academy based here in Dubai with students across the GCC. We essentially focus on the K-12 segment and we teach state-of-the-art coding skills with a focus on Web3 and AI in English and Arabic. That's absolutely incredible. So as you can see, we have an absolute wealth of knowledge and understanding on the panel here today. One of the things that I absolutely loved about our session where we prepared was, apart from us being very geeky and enjoying chatting to each other about it, was the fact that we really are able to share here across the board, whether you are a, a an educator, a leader, whether you are looking at providing external support for students, or even if you're an, an older learner who wants to change careers and change pathways, I think there's some incredible incredible um, people on here to be able to speak to you about that. And with that as well, we have to think about the fact that education has changed phenomenally over the decade. If I think back to when I first started teaching myself, um, IT and digital technology was literally using a projector in my computer room. So that was it's vastly different now. And I think I think from a personal perspective, I really had to start to understand why teaching robotics and teaching digital literacy and what that really meant and how digital fluency skills were important across the school, um, across pollination of subjects is so, so important and understanding that why. So I'm a big believer in all of that, but let's hear it from our people on the ground as well. So I'm going to come to you, Zainab, first. As a classroom practitioner and a leader across a very large group of schools, what's the biggest impact that you see? from learners being immersed in coding and digital literacy? I would say the first thing is around creativity, problem solving skills. These are skill sets that all of our students need in the real world. Um, and I think one of the major things to take away from coding isn't actually about the coding itself. We're in this age right now that we're talking about coding, but we know that obviously AI, we ask students to um, write up some code, we know that AI can do it for them. So we have to think about what are the actual skill set that they want to get out of it and how do we make sure that we tell our students and make them aware of the actual skill set that they're going, why are they doing this? What's the point? What's the point in coding? And um, so that's why I think this webinar is also really important to be able to reiterate that so teachers are able to and and all people part of the community are able to understand the benefits of coding. So being able to um, build some resilience when code doesn't work that really frustrating time when it's a line and you don't know how to fix it and you're not sure where that um, where that issue is and 
trying to build that resilience to be able to keep going and not give up, which I think is really, I'm probably <laughs> not, not the best example. I know my students though, I'll say, I'll look at it for five minutes and then that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. I'll give myself that max amount of time. Then we have to find another solution. Um, so yeah, so building resilience to that, I think is really important. The other thing is around adaptability and making sure that our uh, students are trying to find really creative um, solutions to any problems yeah. that they have you know, trying to work out in um, the variety of different ways as to which platform they're going to use, which code mm. are they going to code in, what are the benefits. Not even that, expanding also to looking at um, the different types of solutions that can be in place because there's a lot of stuff that's already out there. And so trying to be really innovative and creative is, yeah. a, is a huge part of it as well. Absolutely. And I think when students are able to have that that time and that space to get things wrong, like you say, find things, but actually then go, OK, well, hang on a minute, there might be another solution instead of that. You know, quite often I remember used to teach design technology in the UK. It'd be like, this is my design. And that's it. No, that's it. That's the one. And I'd be like, but what about thinking about a little bit more? And actually, I think you're right. Coding really builds some of those really transferable skills. So that's really yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Um, also, Jacqueline, just a note there. Jacqueline's just written there in the comments. Just around AI is a wonderful tool, but would like to teach critical thinking of using AI. Mm. That's actually a really good point. If you ask AI to generate some code for you, you can actually get the students to be able to analyze its effectiveness um, and being yeah. able to make comparisons between them. So uh, that's 100%. a great point as well. Sorry, just wanted to add yeah. that in. I thought that was really No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we are going to come, um, we are, will be answering as many of the questions as possible towards the end of the session as well, if we haven't already answered them within the session. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Hanan, I guess in terms of what you do, it'd be great for you to, to share kind of the, your perspective in terms of the impact of coding. Yeah, I completely echo what Zainab said. It's not just about the end result when it comes to coding. Uh, a big part of our focus being on K-12 is predominantly because we'd like to start early and make sure we're inculcating some skills that are around creativity, logical thinking, right? Um, and not just that, coders also tend to come with a stereotype of being a bunch of introverts, right? So uh, what we've done as an academy is we've collaborated with TED, um, like the ones that do the TED Talks, and we're a TED-Ed approved institution. So as part of our value proposition, we give our students a holistic learning where we do public speaking programs, we teach them how to play chess, uh, not just build the game, but how to actually play it as well. That helps them understand why they're building the product and what the end result is as well. Right, so completely echo what Zainab said. I think it's more of a holistic uh, skill development rather than just technical. It really is. And I think the high element of engagement with that sort of subject is incredible. So Marcus, coming across to you, obviously you deal with our higher education learners. So so what kind of impact are you seeing? So for, for us in uh, at 40 Total W, we really specialize in taking people that uh, have never coded before and then make them into actual coders, right? Um, so 55% of our students have never written a line of code before coming to 40 Total W, which is something that we're incredibly proud of. Um, but it just goes to show you that a lot of the people that we have are looking at a career choice in the sense that they're looking for a shift, uh, a career shift or to upskill themselves or either it's a lateral move uh, within their same industry, within their same company, or, or, or it's a complete trajectory uh, shift uh, based on what they're looking at. And usually that's around uh, trying some new skills and, and realizing that coding is that kind of important skill set that they will need to have. But more importantly, they realize it's a horizontal, it's not a vertical, right? So in any company, coding can enhance any job at any point mm -hmm. that they're doing rather than it just being, it's no longer those introverts, those sitting in the basement, those hiding out in the IT team. It's now kind of embedded uh, across the industry mm -hmm. and uh, across the, the different jobs that the company may be doing. So anybody looks at it and say, well, you know, I today I do this, but if I can code, if I can uh, do data, analysis, if I can understand all of this, then it can actually uh, propel me even higher. And that's something that I think uh, is really, really wonderful that that people are recognizing that mm -hmm. and realizing that, you know what, um, I may not fit the mold of what I initially thought is a coder, but, uh, you know, I'm willing to give it a chance. And, and yeah. people realize that anybody can do it. It is one of those skill sets that's like a muscle. As long as you work it out, you can grow it. That's incredible. And I think one of the, the other aspects of this is that for those learners that are coming to you, it's it's really unlikely that they were taking part in sessions like this. Like if you think about Zainab's level where you've got, I mean, where are students learning to code from Zainab within the GEMS group? I think um, 
well, within the GEMS group, they start pretty early, um, quite early on, but it doesn't come without its challenges. Uh, we have it within our computer science curriculum from a very, very early stage, even FS. Um, but one of the major challenges that we're always going to run into are around uh, experience and confidence of our teachers. Uh, coding, uh, if, if you don't come from that background, it can be fairly difficult and it can be quite overwhelming. And there's a lot of content that primary teachers have to cover as it is. And then you also have to add something completely brand new on top of that, that that can affect someone's confidence. Um, and then it can also make them be a little bit more apprehensive of, of wanting to um, to be able to teach that to other students, because you want to be the expert in the room. That, yeah. That's how it is. But what we're currently seeing is as the years have gone by, we've seen that age get lower and lower and lower of our students doing coding lessons outside of school. Um, so really, really young, even in primary school, they can take loads of free online sessions. Mm. A lot of our students are doing that. So when that happens, obviously that puts the teacher on a back foot where they're like, well, hang on a second, I'm now lo no longer the expert in the room and for yeah. them to feel comfortable with that. So I think one of the major things that we need to do is number one, we need to upskill our primary school teachers, whether that means by putting it as part of, for example, a, a part of our PGCE program. So when mm. uh, teachers go through the qualification process and having that as part of it, just a very kind of basic starting yeah. point. You don't have to be the expert in the room, but what we do need to do is teach teachers how to be able to foster critical thinking mm. in our students. How do you get, how do you provide that little starting point? And then how do you allow the students to kind of run away with it as well? Yeah. And just provide that little kind of probing questions that allows mm. them to be inspired and then to yeah. try and dig in a little bit more themselves um, and yeah. trying to find opportunities for them to be able to look out on their own. So there's so many resources out there at the moment. So I think yeah. just trying to build the confidence in teachers would be would be the first starting point. Simple, simple classes. I mean, what 42 Double W is doing is, is fantastic. It's mm. really inspirational as it allows a whole entire community to be educated for free and, yeah. and, and makes it really, really accessible. So I think that um, that would be the first port of call that I would say. Yeah, and that's incredible. I think it, it's, it is the changing and evolving role, isn't it, of the educator nowadays. And, and exactly as we were talking about at the beginning, and you've mentioned again there, it's, it's critical thinking, it's problem solving, it's resilience, it's, it's actually all these soft skills. It's, it's the fact that, that coders are no longer, you know, hoodies, good geeks, not talking to anybody and wanting to be on their own. Actually, everyone can code. And that's so, so important. And actually, maybe you're right, like breaking down some of these barriers for our our, our teachers who think, well, actually, you know, my specialism is X and kind of getting them to see some of those cross pollinated elements of actually these are just skills. But this is one way to teach them because children really enjoy it. And and as you mentioned as well, with in terms of coding, there are so many different things and types of codes and different ways to do that. And actually that evolving role of an educator is to say, tell me about it, because that's the mastery, right, for students. Hanan, what are you seeing in terms of, of those sorts of, of sort of how many you know students coming along to you, the increased need and requirement for, for people to be able to have a really great curriculum that's external to school? Right. So what we've learned along the way is that every student's coding journey is different, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a limitation that uh, teachers in schools may face is some students may be further ahead in their coding journey, but because they've got a curriculum to follow and not everyone is where they are, they've got to start from scratch, right? Um, and that's essentially where we see a lot of students that come in that say that, okay, we've already done X, Y, Z in school, for instance, scratch, and we'd like to take our coding journey forward. Um, a limitation with schools also is, for instance, KHTA has certain requirements for, for schools to fulfill. So uh, they may not, even as much as they like, they're not, uh, they may not have the bandwidth to complete mm -hmm. a lot within the coding and STEM space. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we sort of come in, right? So we've curated a customized uh, training plan depending on students' age groups and grade groups. And we like to keep them engaged by making sure that they're starting from a level that is suitable to them. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you've got uh, if you're fresh off the boat, we've got a program that starts you from scratch. So you're not overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, and we prefer a one on one learning module because um, we try doing a group session. The ones that have a little bit of knowledge tend to dominate the room and the other ones mm -hmm. tend to get into a shell. Right. Um, and they also witness this in the classroom. 
um, which is why we try and cater the learning programs on a one-on-one -on -one perspective, and that seems to work really well. Mm -hmm. um, we've also been doing a lot of hackathons that let our students then get the sense of gratification where they get to apply what they've yeah. learned, but also see what other students are doing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where, uh, you know, we've, we've found uh, a lot of appreciation from students. And, you know, Marcos has been kind enough to host Code Battle, one of our hackathons that we were planning to do Incredible. last year. And, you know, Fort Double Dhabi has the best campus you could find. It's state of the art. So, yeah, I, I just look forward to going back. It's, it's true. I know. I know Zainab and I are very desperate to go and have a look at all as well. And we'll be we'll be finding him very, very soon. Coming over to that, Marcus, would you I, I one of my questions, I guess there's two parts to this. One, I, I really would like you to tell us a little bit more about Abu Dhabi 42 and the community side of that. But just before that as well, are you seeing an impact of of the change in narrative with people i know obviously you've said a lot you've got a lot of career changes but are you seeing any of the impact from school from people who are leaving school who have got coding backgrounds or, or what, what's it like at avid w42 so uh, a little bit more about 42 with I, I mean i could talk about it all day but just uh being a little bit uh you know uh summarizing it a little bit we are uh, and when i mentioned disruptive education it's it's more along the lines of we don't actually have teachers uh with our projects so it is a peer-to-peer -peer model of education in which collective intelligence is king uh students will gather together and they come up with with different solutions to to come up with uh you know uh, new creative ways to handle each of the projects so we give them projects that they have to do there's a curriculum and each of those projects are kind of somewhat open-ended. It leaves the, the floor open for a lot of creativity for the students to inject into it. Uh, and actually, funny enough, uh, having these creative outlets or having these abilities of leaving some projects open-ended is what ends up defeating a lot of the questions that are coming up related to generative AI. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are worried, well, generative AI is just going to replace coders. And it's it, it's not. It's it, generative AI is able to write you an email, but unless you tell it what to do, unless you, you give it the context that it needs, it's not going to be able to write you anything. So you have to inject that side of humanity towards what you're doing. And code is very similar. It is a creative outlet. It's it's language at the end of the day. You're writing and code can be beautiful. It's just a matter of you're, you're following a different syntax. You're following a different language at the end of the day. And, and I think that's kind of the beauty that people are seeing. And this generative AI trend kind of, blah, you know, it takes away some of that barrier to entry where this was a super kind of expertise that was required mm -hmm. that's no longer there and what it's going to end up doing is just get rid of bad coders it's going to get rid of the google coders but the coders that are actually at a higher level the people that are actually generating algorithms and code and things like that and and fixing their own codes this is amazing for them to be able to continue finding their value and i honestly predict that they'll even get paid even better uh, mm -hmm. because that they, they no longer will need that kind of lower tier of, of developers and so as an industry it's something that's very exciting for us mm -hmm. uh, at 42 Abu Dhabi and because we're higher education you get people that are coming in and either enhancing their careers or shifting their careers as I mentioned but because of that because of what we do is is we want to find a different approach we actually kind of shy away from what most people do when they're doing things around um, secondary education and primary education. And so normally in primary education, it's it's puzzles, it's problem solving, it's logic, it's the, the, the thinking of uh, coding. Whereas in secondary education, there's Python, Java and some other languages. Mm -hmm. We go, no, 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 no. We're starting you from C. We're talking memory management. We're talking bit location we're talking stuff that even if you've been exposed to code in an undergrad setting the students come in and they're like whoa like they had they're like i have a i have a diploma i have a bachelor's in software development and i'm just completely lost and we're like good <laughs> that's what it's supposed to be it's supposed to be a journey of discovery yeah. and when you start with someone who has never coded before they'll come in and they'll be like okay well i have problems with syntax but the, 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 the interesting part about code is that it's so much easier to write code than it is to read it. And so what we've done at 42 is create what we call the norm, which is kind of like MLA or APA, but it's internal to us around code, where you have to structure your code a specific way, which allows the conversation to be on an even playing field. Mm -hmm. If you've never coded before, you come in and you say the norm, well, that's just the way you code. And they go ahead and they just absorb it. And they may have problems with if statements, then statements or algorithms. Yeah. But if you've coded before, all that technical stuff is easy, but then the norm will completely throw you for a loop because you're used to writing any old way that you want. 
And so it's these journey of difficulties that we find that everybody who's able to kind of shed their ego and realize that in a collective environment, you're able to learn from everyone, at least in a specific way, you're able to learn something from someone Mm -hmm. or everyone. Once you're able to shed that ego, the learning is really what takes place. And that is where we find a lot of value for our students, that they find it a formative experience because it truly is about the learning. It's not about getting to the next level. It's not about getting to the next point. It's about them being able to show their learning and learn Mm -hmm. a lot in a very short period of time. Uh, We actually had a... um, we were we we just received our accreditation and we actually had a visit uh, and they were all from uh, they all had PhDs they were all kind of lecturers around uh, software development and uh, one of them walked out after speaking to one of our students and she looked shell shocked and I was like what she was like I just spoke to one of your students I was like okay she was like he his level is compared to what I find my three years to three and a half like after three three and a half years of bachelor students and I was like yeah she's like he's been here sixteen days. Yeah, that's incredible. When you cut everything out and you just throw them off the deep end, that's Mm -hmm. when you get that real kind of burst Mm -hmm. of of light and going, oh my God, this there's so much. Yeah, and I think what's really important to highlight, if if anyone hasn't kind of caught on to that, is that they're all there in person, aren't they? You have Mac Labs, and everyone comes in and they are together. Correct. And I think again, yeah, and that's that's just such a brilliant thing I mean we've heard from Hanan about the public speaking and Zaino about all the different skills and ultimately this digital literacy and literacy of just our skill sets and understanding these cross pollinations and interdisciplinary learning I think it is so incredible I remember so about about four or five years ago I'd have been really freaked out if you just said all those things to me and not really understood what on earth you were on about until I realized that things like an algorithm would could be broken down into me telling the year threes that actually well you brush your teeth every day and that's like a mental algorithm and so when we start to break it down we start to realize that we do all these you know computational things all of the time and it, it leads into what Zainab was talking about as well with with teaching teachers that it's not a scary thing it's not a scary concept we're actually we're all doing it writing a lesson plan is breaking down a code like English for me I remember delivering the um the Apple everyone can code project and showing the the kind of how to take a selfie and it was all broken down into code language and when you work through it and you realize it's really simple and you do it all the time but you just don't think about it and I think there are really great ways for us to be able to 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 embed coding into everything we do and just thinking about it in a different perspective and and bringing and drawing in what from what I can hear from from all of you is these really human skills these connections these these times and places to be able to really be with people um and I just think that's that's an amazing thing to think about isn't it with with something that people find quite hard to sort of get to grips with Yeah, so I actually call the 42 program a soft skill program with the wrapper of a coding program, which is like we get them in and say it's coding, but really what sets it apart is the soft skills, right? Because we've had, since we opened our doors, we've had 22,000 peer evaluations because that's how you submit projects. You're Mm -hmm. evaluated by a peer and they come in and they are all of a sudden it's their friend or somebody they know or someone they have never interacted with and they have to give feedback, receive feedback. They may be more advanced than them or they may be less advanced. And so they have to ask really pointed questions and be able to take that on board and learn from that. And so we, all of that is communication. It's feedback. It's giving feedback, receiving feedback. It's conflict resolution, right? Because Mm -hmm. they may not agree on the right approach. And it's essentially a soft skills program that makes good employees, but then we just sprinkle in a bit of code on top. That's really clever. Hanan, do you think that's probably why you, you're so successful in terms of iCode Junior? Do you think that's because also you embed those soft skills as well? It's not just a learn how to play, how to do Scratch, learn how to you know do this code, Python, etc. It's actually a little bit more embedded and, and there's a bit more depth to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, our, our, our soft skill value proposition definitely adds um, to, to the you know, to the product solution that we offer. But I think it's also important for us to stay current. Um, mm-hmm. For instance, it was extremely satisfying for us to know that um, a lot of students came back to wrote to us and they said that, oh, you know what, when our teachers spoke about ChatGPT, we already knew what it was because we spoke about it in class. 
right? Mm -hmm. So the minute the platform came out, we had our students sign up, they played around with it. That mm -hmm. wasn't really part of the curriculum, right? But because it was new technology, yeah. we sort of involved and added right in there, right? So they get the benefit of being first to the, uh, to the show, right? And that really helps them. Uh, and like Marco said, right, soft skills is key. So even when we do our hackathons, we make sure that part of the judging criteria is teamwork and presentation skills, right? So you're, you're building that uh, holistic approach. Amazing. And often we've been getting a lot of questions on how AI is going to affect coding. And, and I keep telling people that, you know, we're, we're a couple of decades away from true AI. What we essentially have now is machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the kind of code that is being fed into LLMs or the, or the large language models is essentially generic code. So mm -hmm. instead of asking your students not to leverage generative AI, we in fact encourage it, right? If they can cross the first hurdle by simply going to chat GPT and saying, okay, give me the code for an Airbnb clone, and then using that to sort of customize their project for a solution, right? We believe that we should encourage that. So for us, uh, it's not about dismissing AI. We'd like to make sure that we adapt to it, uh, but you still need the sense of code. You still need to know how to code so you could tailor that and customize that to your requirements. Amazing. So just thinking as well about, about it's such an innovative subject still, isn't it? I mean, innovation is, is new. And exactly as you said, Hanan, like, you know, allowing them to try things that are new, being at the forefront of that is really important. And then building those skills around it. Um, in terms of, of our like K to 12, Zainab, where where do you see the, the innovation happening now? Because obviously you you've been doing it a while, I guess. There's two points to this, the reflection of when you first started out, like how did you set up that? So I, I can see questions coming through already about, about, you know, where would you begin? Where would you start essential things? But actually, now that those are embedded within the curriculum, that you've got scaffolds, where where is it that you're finding that you're moving towards now with innovation in, te in coding and in technology and robotics? Well, it's, it's a really good question because we're at a really weird point because of AI, because like what we mentioned before that, students will take that shortcut and will go, oh, let me just use ChatGPT and let it write the code, copy and paste, put it in and thinking like it's it's correct. And it's like, it's not correct um, or not written in the way that we want it to. And um, so I think it is a really, really unique point. I love, I'm actually getting um, inspired a lot by what Marcos and um, Hanan is talking about, because when we're talking about the soft skills, we know in K-12, like this naturally will happen in particular scenarios that you place the kids in. So if we're talking about within the classroom in computer science, yes, we know we teach the structures, we teach the basics of coding and all of those elements, but actually the soft skills stuff comes out of the competitions um, that we put the students in. And so things like when we run our own school hackathons or when we ask students to be able to do out, we do like a GEMS uh, GIC, which is like a global innovation challenge where we ask students to like work on new types of solutions for world problems. We don't actually demand for particular elements like coding to be a part of it. Yeah. But actually, when you think about it, where you want them to be actually quite creative and you want them to be able to build those soft skills, um, that would be a perfect opportunity for them to do that because it's something that's that yeah. they've never really had to consider before. So it's trying to fuse whatever they're learning within the classroom and fusing that in with the competitions. When we're talking about um, innovation itself, I mean, look, I'm speaking to the innovation queen, Philip I mean, like, ultimately, <laughs> we've obviously um, crossed many paths, <laughs> many conferences and many stages together, but... Um, I think with innovation, the idea is how can you try to be able to make something yeah. still relevant um, when you feel that something is really important and, and you, you t tend to work towards things that are close to your heart. And mm -hmm. so where, where you, when you're from a computer science background, coding is always going to be close to your heart. So you, you know that you're going to try and find ways to be able to ensure that students are still learning coding. But you're like in the same way what Marcus was saying, you're kind of packaging in, in a different way. Yeah. And I think that's actually a really good idea um, for schools to be able to do. And it doesn't take much planning. Whereas, I mean, creating a, a lesson and teaching students how to code takes a little bit more planning to do. But actually, when we're talking about building soft skills, you just have to set up the environment. You just have to set up the space. You just have to set yeah. up the time. Like if Absolutely. you just allow these students the time in the timetable to be able to experiment and to fail and, mm -hmm. and help them to understand that, you know, like like what um, Hanana Marx was saying, it's not generally the output, it's just helping them, giving them the space and the time to go through the process. You're gonna get so much more out of it. Do you get the students working together collaboratively? Mm -hmm. You'll get an opportunity for, for you to see in front of your eyes how mm -hmm. they are being able to deal with these problems uh, that come up. So if you'd start to design an environment where you say, look, this is the challenge, 
coding mm -hmm. is a part of it, you can implement AI because you can say, if you do use AI, the same way, for example, with IB, you're saying you can use AI, but you have to be able to state the date that you accessed it and the prompts that you use. You can do exactly yeah. the same thing here. You can still fuse the two together and ask students to declare what prompt that they were using. You'll see they'll be a little bit more creative and a little bit more careful about what they're um, putting into, mm -hmm. into ChatGPT or whatever engine that they decide to use. So there's a lot you can do with it and it doesn't actually take a lot of planning to do. It yes. is when it's not, you just got to break it down to mm -hmm. providing like an afternoon or a series of workshops that the students yeah. can engage with. Just an opportunity for them to be able to collaborate and, and kind of not leaving it to computer science because that's not yeah. actually where the magic happens. The magic yeah. happens outside of that. I totally agree. And I think, I think from, from a perspective of being very fortunate to visit a lot of places, places, a lot of schools, a lot of, a lot of universities and colleges, continuity is absolutely key and like you don't get there do you without that continuity they they have to know the basics it's like English and maths you know you have to know your basics and your foundations to be able to have those moments that you can innovate and take them into those spaces and things um I guess before we move on to someone else I just wanted to ask you about what's the difference that you see between your your sort of primary students and your secondary students so because there is a difference. Like when I when I look at the way we teach in primary school and we're very creative, we're very hands-on, we've got all these robotics, we've got spheros running everywhere, B bots, et cetera, and all these really creative, like inspiring sort of moments. And then for, not, be, not to kind of taint it slightly, but you do go into a computer science lesson in, in sort of key stage three or, or your senior high schools. And it is a lot of computers and a lot of looking. So how do we keep that momentum of, keeping those pockets of innovation and collaboration happening with those older students? Um, I think for Key Stage 3 is actually our mo most creative, I'll be honest. Oh, great, um, good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because you can play with it. You can play mm. a lot with the Key Stage 3 curriculum, um, especially in the British curriculum school. You're not actually, you're, you're only bound by the skills, but it's up to you what context that you bring that in. Um, so we've brought in a, a lot of different types of platforms that allow students to be able to experiment that aren't actually part of um, the GCSE uh, mm -hmm. because we have that kind of playtime of three years where, we're, where we have the scope to do that. So we actually bring in DT, um, DT tools, media tools, ICT tools and computer science tools all together. Amazing. So it just gives them that chance to be able to experiment. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, there is coding. So we do have, this, this is the thing, we do have an actual coding part that each yes. um, year group will go through and we'll make it age appropriate, but we also differentiate. So if they want to do, for example, they're still working, getting their head around Blockly, then we would allow them to use Blockly. But actually with our more advanced students, then they would do, they would be able to code in Python and Java straight away. Um, so we differentiate it a lot, but it just gives, again, all we're trying to do is give them that space to be able to learn, but, mm. but making sure that they understand the concepts around it. It's when we hit GCSE, and IB. Uh, so we have GCSE leading up to IB, but obviously there's GCSE leading up to A level mm. as well. When you're bound by an exam board, that's when it come, becomes a little bit more difficult. Yeah. You don't have as much space to be able to play, but um, there are a couple of changes that are being made across some exam boards. Um, for example, with the Cambridge one, they recently made uh, algorithmic thinking 50% of your grade, whereas before it was, it was a lot more smaller. So there are um, changes that are being made bit by bit. A lot of it is based around just the, the logic behind it and the concepts mm. behind it. Uh, but ultimately, what they don't include uh, at GCSE is an opportunity to be able to code something of their own, um, yeah. which allows them to experiment as in something that they create that they can create it's themselves. Their own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they have an opportunity to work with Python, but it's kind of within a particular context, but but mm. not actually get to demonstrate it. In IB at sixth form, at post 16, then they have an opportunity to be able to be a little bit more creative. They can choose the platform that they want to do because there's coursework that's involved. Yeah. So I would say that if someone's selecting and choosing which type of exam board that they want to go, be very careful and making sure that there is a space for students to be to be creative and to be able to create their mm -hmm. own um, to create their own prototypes. When it comes to primary school, again, we we have obviously the computing um, curriculum, but this kind of leads in again with the concepts and and I think it's the the normal one, the normal tool that everyone uses, yeah. Scratch and Power of Code and things like that. But mm -hmm. what we what we do need to do is we need to see more schools pulling in more things like hackathons, working yeah. with some of the ed tech companies to be able to support them with that, pull in a little bit more robotics as well because that can also increase engagement. There we go. See. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hanan, I was going to ask you next actually because in terms of that, I, I I know we were talking about. Um, 
in our kind of prep session about international schools but actually um one of the things that I think is really interesting obviously is the fact that that you can kind of go across all schools and all curriculums because you're not kind of bound by that um like what what do you see as being is, are there barriers to students learning are they are you finding that there there is a requirement that certain students need a bit of upskilling or or do they all quite kind of progress at a really similar age and stage uh, so stand up, look me up. Uh, we'll do those hackathons <laughs> <ones> together. <laughs> but uh, Philippa, back to your question. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there are some schools that have um, STEM labs that would put you know most professional facilities to shame. I mean, the kind of robotic arms they have, uh, the yeah. kind of infrastructure they have, and obviously, you know, they come with the curriculum that automatically give the students of those schools a leg up against mm -hmm. the others. Um, the idea behind ICO Junior was to try and bridge the gap between what education, you know, uh, some students in the West are getting versus students mm -hmm. in you could, for the lack of a better word, an Ivy League school versus mm -hmm. a regular school. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and with coding, fortunately, there isn't much of an investment when it comes to hardware. Right. So if it's about upskilling, it just depends on intent and ambition. Mm -hmm. right? uh, we try and curate the same kind of programs that would be accessible to someone that comes from a school that would be uh, that would have access to those state of the art STEM labs mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, ones that wouldn't. We give access to parents to certain robotics kits that fundamentally would teach them the same technical skills. Right, which can then be scalable and adaptable across different platforms. Mm -hmm. Right, so we try and package our solution in a way where we're giving them a low cost solution, try and bridge that mm -hmm. gap the best that we can. But yeah, there is there is room for improvement across several schools there. Mm. Yeah, because I think that the digital divide is is huge. Um, even in in the GCC region, is is absolutely phenomenal in terms of, of one school to another. And and I guess that's why probably quite a lot of people reach out to to you for your support because. It is something where where it depending on which school you go to depends on how much value they necessarily put into that or even time restraints with the curriculums and, and the amount they have to fit in with the with KHTA and, and Sphere and, and um, ADEC. Um, and actually, it's something that 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 could potentially hinder somebody's progress. And I guess, Marcus, that's where it comes back to kind of, you know, 42 Abu Dhabi is where you kind of you're you're free you're, you're an application process do you do you ever have any um and obviously you've got the labs and things but do you find that people have any um barriers in terms of them being able to access what you're doing and what you're offering the whole point of what we try to do is to kind of get rid of all those barriers of access right so the the barrier for us really is logistics so w is not cheap to live in um, and so, you know, it's, uh, we do offer food, we offer transportation to our students, we offer visas. Um, so, you know, it, and the tuition is completely covered. It's, it's completely free for any of our students. So, you know, we knock down as many of those walls as possible, but for example, we don't have a dorm, uh, and we don't, uh, we don't pay for accommodation. Although after a certain point, some students may be eligible for a scholarship, like an award program, uh, to specifically help with those living costs. But it, you know, at first you kind of have to, to self seed, you have to kind of fund yourself. So, um, I think that would be the number one barrier because we're not online. It's not something that you can pick up and do, but what we have noticed, uh, you know, is the, the retention rate of those online programs are usually very low. And, and that's not something that we have a problem with. We do have a higher dropout rate than you would expect in other higher education institutions because there's no commitment. You're not paying tuition, uh, but we also have um, a much higher retention rate when they commit, right? So depending on the number of hours they do, yeah. um, once a, once you're past a certain point, they just really commit to it unless they find a job or, or something else. So um, it's, you know, and because we don't look at SAT, GMAT, whatever, like we don't look at test scores. Um, oh, I don't have a high school diploma. doesn't matter. Like we mm -hmm. don't, we don't look at any of that because it's through our system end to end. It really is kind of like, look, as long as you're able to kind of commit and do the work that you do, yeah. this isn't something that is a trick question. This isn't something that you need previous knowledge for. We'll give you every single tool to succeed as long as you're able to commit and learn. Mm. And that's that's one of the one of the things that we are very proud of what we do is just to give people that you would not expect the ability to learn, right? So you may mm -hmm. find people from all sorts of different walks of life. We have a DJ who wanted to have better concerts. Uh, we have a postdoctorate who wanted to further her research and uh, wanted to process large levels of data. Uh, we had cabin crew from Emirates 
And then we had a Taliban delivery driver in kind of all in the same group working together. It's incredible. Uh, it's, it? it's people from all walks of life. You have people running away from, from uh, you know, uh, horrible situations like uh, the, the war with uh, Russia and Ukraine or, or Sudan or anything like that. And, mm. and, you know, they find a home with us. And yeah. we're very, very proud of that. We're very happy to help uh, in mm. any way that we can. So. Yeah. An amazing community to be part of as well. It's fantastic. I think yeah. even that, again, is, is having the skills to be able to, as you were saying earlier, like the forget your ego. It's kind of we're all here for the same thing and we all want to learn and we all want to participate. And actually, you know what, if you don't want to be part of it, that's great. But, you know, give the place to someone else and move on. But actually, that's it's such an opportunity. Yeah. And um, when you were saying about when you get to a certain part, it's like any habit, isn't it? Is it like 21 days and then you it's your habit exactly. as long as you continue on with it? That's fantastic. I think um, thinking about that, that kind of equality and divide, I guess, as well, Zainab, when you think about students in an international setting, such a transient nation, students literally can enroll in a new school every year how do you find students kind of settle in and, and do you find that there's a there's a big skills gap when they come to school when they when they come to the school um I feel like I wouldn't say it's good because it's going to be varied every child is going to be different and they'll have a, a different set of skills when they come and join us I think that when we see students integrating from let's say within Dubai um, and then they come over to our school and then they'll share all the things that they might have done at their old school. And we try and figure out ways and how we can implement that as well, because it's something that they want to be the expert in. So it gives them a bit of confidence and we can say, yeah, absolutely. You can run your own club as well to be able to educate others. Let's go like I'll learn as well. So the, it, it becomes a really collaborative and open environment, which is quite nice when we have students that are coming in from other countries. That's amazing so we'll have let's say a student that um hasn't even delved into coding probably didn't really have much access to internet even and if they come over to our school and then will they come over to dubai then we open the world up to them and we say look you can do this you can do this you can be involved in this and there's the whole world of opportunities and we try to lead by their passion i think that's literally the core of everything that i've done um and the school has done and the school yeah. has kind of inspired me to do that because i think where we are at the moment this it's completely multicultural students have come from mm. all over and they've all come with a different set of ideas different set of passions of what they want to do and different things that they're interested in so we try and find a way to be able to fuse their passions with things that we're doing to allow them to excel and to allow them to be really in, interested and inspired um mm. so when we have students that maybe have come from other countries that um have delved in stuff like this or robotics or have used like a particular robotics kit or whatnot I say come mm. let's have a look let's try yeah. it out and and that's why I think also if you are a teacher and you are a computer science teacher and um, starting off with a platform like LinkedIn is really important really make connections with some mm. um, ed tech companies that are around you the especially whether it's UAE, UAE in particular is is very very collaborative Mm -hmm. um, but around the world anyway, around ed tech, everyone's super helpful. Everyone just constantly, they're, they're, there's loads of WhatsApp groups and things like that of people that are willing to lend you a hand. If you want to borrow robotic kits, people are very open to that. Mm -hmm. um, if you just want to get some advice, you want to get some resources, everyone's super helpful. And I think around the world, I think um, the community around innovation and digital technology is probably the best so far that I've ever seen. And um, so there's just so much to learn from other people. So I would say that that's, if you take anything away would be around that is open your doors a bit. You, you've got to look outside your four walls of your classroom. Mm. And there's so much to learn, so much to learn. If you go in there with an open mind, there's yeah. so much that you're able to take back into your classroom and inspire those students. And I think because community, Community actually was, was going to be the next sort of thing that I guess um, in terms of, of outreach and that's just so it's so true I, I've never met a community of people who are so much more willing to share and give and support and and I wonder whether that's it's because of the nature in terms of what we teach students as a skill of like it's okay to say I don't know and I think that's such an important piece of resilience isn't it and I think all the people that, that you interact with daily um both at 42 Abu Dhabi and at, at Code Junior is, is just about being able to say, actually, you know what, I don't know. Can you help? Teach me. Tell me what's next. Um, and, and that's probably what we also need to encourage a lot more of our teachers to do is to say, actually, it's OK if you don't know, but you won't know unless you ask. And we don't know what we don't know. Right. So I think that's really important. Um, so, I mean, I, I would love everyone to just, I guess, share something about community collaboration. I mean, Hanan, you've been keep talking about these hackathons. Tell us about these hackathons that you and Marcus have uh, been um, 
been doing? Um, something really interesting came out of the last one that we did. Um, we were actually rolling out a theme for um, a game that we were asking the students to build where they would have to build an underwater theme game. Um, and a student actually comes up and asks us, can I build a game where I'm cleaning up the ocean as part of the, the project? And then we get points for removing as much trash as possible. Um, and, and that was such a pleasant surprise for us is because, um, and I think this is where it's coming from the schools as well, where a lot of activities the students are doing revolve around sustainability. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was extremely satisfying and gratifying for us. That was, that was a great experience. Um, but yeah, in, in, in terms of the hackathons that we do, what we try and do is um, we try and bring in students from various schools together. So uh, students are actually working as a group. It's a team event and they compete with students from other schools. So not just um, amongst their peers, but they also get a sense of understanding of how students from different schools are coding. It helps them understand, uh, you know, what they need to do to sort of up their game to stay ahead of the learning curve. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've grown to a community of over a thousand coders now from more than a hundred schools across uh, the UAE. Um, a lot of a lot of gems students in fact sign up uh <laughs> gems wellington okay. in fact won the last hackathon that we did uh and it's been extremely rewarding because you know they just want to come back uh for more to try and not just showcase their skills but also learn from other coders and that mm. sort, of, sort of helps us drive our mission home i think again like you've said the word team you've said the word collaborate mm. their community i think it just all goes back to actually this just so human. Zainab, I'd really love you to share the story of your hackathon from your school with the teachers and the students. Absolutely. Um, It was the best thing. It was definitely the highlight. Um, Hopefully she is watching. But one of um, our amazing, amazing um, head of digital learning, Abba Natha, um, she designed an amazing hackathon um, because we'd actually offered. We said, look, we can bring in a company and we could, sorry. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Bring in the company. I mean, that's what I was saying. It was going so well. (laughs) I know, it was going really well. And uh, no, but I said, look, um, we can bring in this um, and and we can, um, and we were looking at like what the plan would look like. And um, Abada was like, no, I I think I can do this. And she was like, I think uh, I've already got it in my head about I'd want this, I'd want this, I'd want this. And I know which students I'd want involved. She has a fantastic army of uh, student digital leaders who were fantastic, really, really talented students. Um, And so she had designed this hackathon and um, it was amazing. It was it was running for like a whole day and students were bopping in and out like between their lessons and then they would go back in and it would be a different year group that would get involved. And then we have houses so there'll be like a point system going up um, that was going on throughout the day. It was amazing. So when it came to uh, I think it was either break time or lunchtime. We actually brought in down uh, the assistant head teacher. So these are people that they're like, one's a PE teacher, one's a science teacher. <laughs> these are they who don't really engage with coding at all. And they were working alongside the student, um, the student digital leaders who were just assisting. Um, and then they they started coding as well. Amazing. And they were like involved in the challenge. And it was amazing that the atmosphere was absolutely electric. It was, we had it in the cafe as well. So it's completely communal area. You can just imagine like the atmosphere. It yeah. was it was amazing. And it was definitely one of the massive highlights that we've had at the school. And so we are doing another one this year. Really, really excited about it. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was an amazing way to be able to showcase the student digital leaders. And, and that was the point of it. And, it. and the idea as well was to get people inspired and engaged who'd never who'd never engaged with coding yeah. before. Um, and so that was probably one of the best things that I'd love seeing is seeing the assistant heads just focusing like this and being really really competitive Um, (laughs) yeah it was amazing it was lovely so yeah we really enjoyed it I mean I would say I mean look we were just really we're really lucky that we do have uh that talent in our school and and Mm -hmm. and she she run events like that in our school before um but I think 100% if you do have a company that is is willing to support you with that um 100% I would say do it if you can try and find a way to do it in the communal area where other people can get involved as well and, and involve like different members of your team, involve mm-hmm. uh, the head teacher even, like our head teacher will come and, and have a go at some of our events. It's really important. It's really important for the students to yeah. see yeah. adults not be the expert. They need to see that. Yeah. And so that, that was really exciting. That's really cool. No, I think that's brilliant. And it, and like you say, it really showcases them. But again, as Hanan said earlier, like it can start off with such a simple amount. Like you don't necessarily have to be a massive school or a big school group to do things like that actually. 
a device of any sort really can can kind of start you on your journey, can't it? By the um, way, it's gonna, uh, sorry, Abydos team actually came in second, by the way, in the in the hackathon that we did. So yeah, kudos. Yeah, she sounds like a, an absolute treasure. Well done. She, she, she is an absolute treasure. She's amazing. Um, but yeah, that's that's the thing as well. Like getting in, getting involved with different types of competitions and things like mm. that in the community as well is is okay. amazing. It's a great way to just build their confidence. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, Marcus, I'm going to come to you first. So looking ahead, what do you believe are the emerging trends in in coding, but digital literacy and thinking of the things that, what do you need people to be coming to you with, no matter their background, wherever they're from, what, what kind of skills are you needing and what, what are the trends in, in your sort of sector? Um, honestly, I think for me, I, I think the, the common answer everybody's talking about is AI, but honestly, for me, it's just uh, learning to learn. Uh, I think I think what really the skills that they really need to come to me at is being able to understand that nowadays they can have an answer to any question they may have. Yeah. It's just a matter of wanting to go and find it. And I yeah. think, you know, given the fact that we're named 42 after the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it's supposed to be kind of the answer to the ultimate question about life, the universe and everything. I think that that answer is is great if you have a massive ego in, in my side. I don't believe that 42 is the answer to, to, to everything. I don't believe that 42 is, is the meaning of life. What I, what I really think is when you ask the right questions, you'll get the right answers, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's about the journey of learning how to ask the questions and about how being able to find your own answers is really important. And it's this shift of instead of having teachers, you have facilitators. You have people mm -hmm. that may guide you, that may mentor you. But at the end of the day, the answers that you find and you come up with are your own. And mm -hmm. that's something that no AI is ever going to be able to take away from us. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's part of what makes us human and will never, ever, ever be replicated. And so I think that, that injecting of the size of your personality or, or having that bit about it that makes us human and 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 real is something that will will live forever and that's that's what I, I would like students to to have from a very early age is that ability to and that confidence to be able to say I can find my own answer I can sort mm -hmm. through the multiple different answers to this question and find what is more relevant or what is more accurate, what isn't, uh, you know, what fits my style, what doesn't. And so I think that's that's the biggest uh, trend that I would see in the future is, is less about let's be indoctrinated, let's memorize, and more about how am I able to sort through this wash mm -hmm. of information that we have and find what appeals to me and what makes sense to me. Yeah, that's wonderful. I feel like 42 Abu Dhabi is not the end of a journey, really, for most. I think that's really is probably the seed that plants the forest of, of their journey, really. So I think it sounds incredible what you're doing. Um, Hanan, what do you think, what what are we doing or what do, you, what do we think we need to be doing to prepare students for the future? Uh, well, actually, I think as, as educators, we just have to keep on innovating. And that's something that we spend about 60% of our time on, just trying to figure out how we can keep up with the evolution in technology, right? Um, with the comings of Web3, with the comings of blockchain, with the comings of AI. Uh, what we recently did, for instance, to edify our students on blockchain, rather than giving them theoretical lessons, we actually started giving them crypto tokens for just attending classes on time, completing assessments. <laughs> Right? And then they can redeem these uh, tokens for merchandise that they get, like an Ico Junior T-shirt, so on and so forth. Um, so part of the journey also takes them through understanding how crypto tokens work, how mm -hmm. blockchain tends to work, what is decentralization, right? Um, so for us, and you know, I think it's, it's imperative that we try and innovate to, uh, in the ways we teach our students. It can't be theoretical. That's something we tried and failed miserably at. We're at an age where there's instant gratification. If they don't see an outcome at the end of the session, it's not something that's going to stick, right? Like Marco said, online learning has a tendency to have low retention rates mm -hmm. if it's theoretical, if it's monotonous, if it's robotic. Uh, so, yeah, innovation is something that is key for us. We're working really hard to implement AI as part of our curriculum. Mm -hmm. Rather than teaching just coding, we're going to uh, focus on teaching coding with AI because that's the direction we're heading in how we could use uh, lang large language models, how we could use generative AI to enhance uh, the coding experience. So that's key for us at Ico Junior right now. Fantastic, thank you, Hanan. And finally, my last question to Zainab, what, um, what are schools focusing on to ensure that they are future ready? So what are skills are we focusing on? 
I think AI is our buzzword at the moment around <laughs> trying to trying to work it out and trying to yeah. how to be able to navigate our way around it. One thing I would say for schools is to is to have a core set of teachers who are passionate and really interested in technology and and basically just building an R and D team. We don't really have R and D teams in in mm. our schools, mm. and um, and I think that we need to start with with what's happening right now. With there's so much ambiguity around AI and other tech tools and how yeah. to be able to implement them. And, and so I think we do need a really good core team that works throughout the year to be able to share any kind of best practice or any good case mm -hmm. studies and make that those help to make those decisions. Um, I think one of the other elements that we also need to look into is kind of echoing what Hanan is saying around uh, teaching students. Uh, you, you mentioned like AI with coding. I mean, there are so many free mm -hmm. AI Google courses, for example, yeah. like that students are able to take. Right now, we're we're so scared and worried about students using AI in the wrong way with um, with their work. But actually, we actually need to be building a cohort of students that know how to be able to build their own models. Yeah. We don't have that. It's not in any of the exam boards, so we don't have that at school. And so it's quite scary that we're just going to have this massive gap. Mm -hmm. Before we were worried that there was going to be a coding gap, and now there's going to be an even bigger problem. That we're going to have like Absolutely. a massive cohort of students that, if we're if we're talking about worried about dealing with students like the ethics of AI and making sure that they understand, we'll get them to understand how to be able to build mm. models and get them to 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 be able to understand what goes on behind the scenes, which mm. I think is really important. So even we we need to be looking at this as well um, at our school, and we are looking into what courses would be the best thing for our students, but we mm. do need to look at. Um, how to be able to find that space in a timetable, a flexible timetable, um, yeah. to allow students the space to complete these courses. Not just saying go away and do the course, it's yeah. providing that space within school for yeah. them to be able to do it. Um, when it comes to skills, I would break it down completely to things like computational thinking and just stripping it right down. Mm -hmm. Things like that, pattern recognition, algorithmic thinking, these can be applied to real life. Like we say mm -hmm. this to the kids all the time, computer science solves everything. Yeah. If you really have a problem with it, could be anything in the entire world. If you do use the computational thinking strategies, then you will be able to solve it. And That's and so I think stripping things that back down to that and not overcomplicating it, I mm -hmm. think is the key point. And that doesn't cost any money. That's one of the biggest things that people always say in schools that like we don't have money for robotics. And that's fine. You can still teach yeah. particular concepts that they're able to transfer um, yeah. when when they do progress and when they do leave school. Yeah. That's so true. And it's so interdisciplinary. It's part of real world. It's part of everything. And it's actually something that every teacher could do. Um, understanding those concepts helps them break down all their subject areas. That's fantastic. Right. We have a few minutes, literally. Um, so we may have to be pretty swift with these, but we have a few questions. Um, so uh, I'm going to say this wrong and I totally apologize in advance. Uh, Zara Fashan. Uh, says with all AI with AI all around, students tend to generate solutions instantly using ChatGPT or similar platforms. While we as subject expert, experts question their logic and algorithmic efficiency, uh, efficiency, uh, what would you suggest would be a good approach to ensuring their creativity and logical skills and are still being developed with the use of AI when coding? We may have touched on it slightly, but would anyone like to sort of do a quick summary? Uh, sure, sure, I'll take that one. Uh, so essentially what we do is we, um, it, it all depends on the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Uh, so we try and structure our problem statement in such a way where we encourage the use of AI, but it has to have a certain amount of uh, manual intervention where we're assessing uh, the person's creativity, right? So if we're giving them a problem where they need to develop a learning application uh, mm -hmm. for a kindergarten student, while they may be able to get the pseudocode to develop a generic app, when it comes to customizing a certain parameters is where you're you know, assessing uh, you know, the subjectivity of the problem. Uh, so it, it, has to, it has to revolve around making sure that you're tailoring uh, the assignment in a way where it's not entirely solvable by generative AI. And, and it's not smart enough to do that right now. It's essentially it's just mm -hmm. machine learning, right? Um, so you're sort of, you've got that, that human touch to it. Right. And, and, and another thing that I'd like to talk about also is security around uh, AI, right? So there's there's a lot of scope for deep fakes, uh, you know, images that can be created that can be misleading towards individuals, right? Mm -hmm. so, so edifying students and how to stay safe, not just on the internet, but also with AI out there. Yeah, thank you so much. This one is directed to, directly for you, Zainab. Um, so this is from Faisal. 
So what would your perspective look for readiness of K-12 schools in the region to adopt AI in education? Should educators still be teaching coding without supplementing it with AI? Um, and if we should adapt AI, adopt AI sorry, in education, by what level? So quite, there's a few questions. A, <laughs> the last bit is a very tough question. When should yeah. we adopt AI in education? I think um, it's really difficult because I know that right now the schools are in the middle of developing their own AI policies. And I know us as a group, uh, as a GEMS group, we, we are... Uh, I know some individual schools have come out with their own AI policies, but as a GEMS group, we're looking at how to be able to provide something a bit more blanket, um, because I think teachers are a little bit at the moment going, shall we, shall we not? The kind of rule that we kind of go by is um, if you're lower school, so this is if you're very, very, very young and we're kind of reaching about up to nine years old, um, so lower school going into middle school, I would suggest that the teacher is the facilitator um, and not the student using it themselves. So it can be used in class. I think it's I, I think students very, very from a very young age should understand the concept of AI. Even yeah. I mean, FS students, I don't mind that we don't mind that, but it's the actual concept of them using it for a safety perspective. We have to be careful. ChatGPT is thirteen years plus. We can't say mm -hmm. oh it's okay for for sure. kids younger than that, but then we're going oh but you can't use Snapchat. Like we have to be yeah. quite consistent there. So that's one of the challenges that we're currently facing. Um, and I don't believe it should be blocked, but we, they should be educated. So yeah. we should be educating our students how to use it properly. Um, when it comes to upper school, we have ethics. So we have a ethics use policy, which is basically mm -hmm. saying you can use it for research, but this is not a place where you would be copying and mm -hmm. pasting. Um, and if you are using it, then you have to declare your prompt. Yeah. Um, but we need to do, we need to raise a lot more awareness around that, and especially across the the gems group. So we're working around that. But I would say that at the moment, we're with there's so I think um, for example, I don't we can mention uh, particular names, but like Magic School, uh, the student version came out recently. Um, but then even so, there's a lot of things flying around at the moment about its safety and and what mm -hmm. it can. Um, when the the issue is advice, and we just mm -hmm. got to be careful about AI yeah. giving advice to students. To and that's students. Kind of like, yeah, exactly. So we're just looking at what the guardrails would be. Um, what was the other? What was the first part of the question for using AI and coding? Hang on a second. It's actually disappeared into the answered yeah. questions. Oh, wait, I can't see it. <laughs> it, was about um, using AI. it was about using using it in. Yes, it was yeah. about coding I think and AI. So, yeah, I think like what we mentioned before, it was just the idea of being able to um, get let, allowing them to use it. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if they're a lot older allowing them to use it, but then being able to analyze its effectiveness, efficiency, mm -hmm. um, and its language, and just making sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So allowing students to compare, could be things like comparing different languages and looking and trying to work out where the different concepts are um, mm -hmm. and trying to break it down. There's, there's a lot of different ways in how you can use it, but I wouldn't say steer clear of it. I would say embrace it, but educate. Amazing. I can see that we've uh, we've probably come to time, um, although I'm sure we'll be able to get some extra questions out to people um, either on social media or um, or some other way. Um, but thank you so much, all of you. It was absolutely a pleasure. Um, if anybody would like to reach out to any of these guys to speak about about what they're doing a little bit more, then I'm sure that, as we've mentioned, we're all very open to answering questions, talking about what we do and supporting educators across across the world actually not just the middle east um so please feel free to to reach out and give us a shout um i think from my perspective what i what i've mentioned a few times here is is you know this is all about human connection we may be talking about computers and the use and the way that we do computing but actually ultimately what we're showing is an absolute cross you know interdisciplinary learning cross pollination of skills physical skills where we're talking we can you know we're being critical we're looking at, at what we're doing we're questioning we're getting deeper and we're doing it together we're collaborating in person and the majority of the time and and actually as marcus said that that's really impacting on how well people are doing when we work together we we do things better we do them for longer and and i think with coding where it can be so so vast and there's so many different opportunities to learn in different ways but also it's, it's very much a community thing so I think that's for me that's a lovely thing to hear especially when so many people are so worried about humanity. <laughs> Brilliant well that was an incredible discussion and very informative thank you so much Philippa, Marcus, Zainab and, and Hanan. Uh, I know there were a few questions that we couldn't get to unfortunately because of time but we'll try to get to them uh, hopefully after the webinar maybe by email as you 
mentioned uh, Philippa or on social media. Uh, and if anyone from the audience as well has any further questions or would like to connect with uh, with our speakers, then please, uh, you can do so through LinkedIn or send us an email to marketing at guesteducation.com. Uh, you'll also be redirected to a short survey once we end the webinar. So please tell us what you thought and if there are any topics you'd like to hear about. If you want to enjoy the webinar all over again, uh, you can do so as we'll be uploading it to our uh, YouTube channel as well as our guest education website and sending it out to all attendees by email. A massive, massive thank you to our panel and also you, our audience, for tuning in. We'll be announcing our upcoming webinar very soon, so please make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter, follow us on social media, and visit guesteducation.com to stay informed of our latest events. Until next time, take care and have a lovely day and rest of the week. Bye-bye for now.